I want to go over a quick course review of all the things we've accomplished and then talk about project understanding. In particular, we're going to add to our uh, concept there and talk about what are called decision making traps. We started the course with the crisp DM flow chart where we have these various phases of developing a data science project, including project understanding, data understanding, data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and deployment. And we've spent a lot of time looking at details under most of these boxes. Under data understanding, we looked at different types of data visualizations, box plots, histograms, binning, density, scatter plots, uh, jitter and radar, spider and parallel plots, and we used it all in uh, ggplot2, a somewhat complex package in the R programming language. We also talked about correlation, different types of correlation, Pearson, Spearman, Kendall, Tau, heat maps, correlation matrices, and so on. We looked at dimension reduction, including principal component analysis, uh, and some visualizations for that, including scree plots and biplots. We talked about outliers, univariate outliers, multivariate outliers, outlier identification, detection, classification, and we have some tests that help us with that. And we also talked about missing values, the three types of missing values. Missing completely at random, missing at random, and missing not at random. We moved on to data preparation and we said, well, how can we deal with some of these issues? So we talked about standardization, a variety of forms of standardizing our data, transformations, including the ladder of powers, box cox transformations, feature engineering in general, also feature selection, forward, backward, bidirectional, stepwise techniques. We've come up with techniques for dealing with missing values, including complete case analysis, available case analysis, and using indicator variables. We also talked about single imputation methods, mean imputation, hot deck, regression, regression with error, k nearest neighbors, imputation, predictive mean matching, and so on. And then we improved even on that and said, let's talk about multiple imputation. And we ended up using multiple imputation with chained equations, a mice package in R. We also talked about distance, the idea of distance, of similarity and dissimilarity. We talked about Euclidean distance, Jacquard distance, edit distance, Gower's distance, and so on. We've covered a lot of material. Then we moved into modeling and talked about the concepts of interpretation versus predictive power. So you give up some of your interpretability when you want to improve that predictive power and vice versa. We have two major types of learning, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, we talked about prediction and classification techniques, including multiple linear regression, ridge regression, lasso, elastic net, partial least squares regression. We talked a little bit about support vector machines we did a lot on logistic regression and interpreting what those models are, uh, the interpretation of odds and log odds and, and the actual models themselves. And we looked at a penalized version of logistic regression called GLMNet. We talked about decision trees and ensembles of decision trees, including the idea of complexity parameters, uh, impurity measures such as Gini and entropy, uh, information gain, information gain ratio, uh, and pruning and growing trees, and, and et cetera. And we looked at the ensembles of those trees, including bagging and boosting and, and random forests. We also talked about the idea of overfitting and error analysis when we are dealing with supervised learning. We have different types of error. We can look at the residuals, the standardized residuals, the studentized residuals, and so on. We have leverage of our data points, Cook's D, AIC and BIC scores. We have collinearity, variance inflation factors, R squared and adjusted R squared. And we talked about how we can tune the hyperparameters for our variety of models. In unsupervised learning, we talked about principal component analysis and most recently clustering. Three major types, partitional, hierarchical, and density-based clustering. In the partitional clustering, we looked at k-means and k-metoids. In hierarchical clustering, we looked at uh, some visualizations for that as well as multiple linkage techniques, single, complete, average, centroid, and wards method for linkage. And then density-based clustering, we talked uh, basically the uh, how this is a, a very different theory and it produces different types of clusters than either k-means or hierarchical clustering. We evaluate our models based on using data partitioning strategies where we can break our data up to the train test and validation samples or more likely use k-fold cross-validation or leave one out cross-validation or re repeated k-folds, which was one of my favorites, and bootstrapping. This also helps us with the hyperparameter tuning. 
When we talk about error on our classification models, we have a variety of things that we can look at, including misclassification costs, false positives, false negatives, sensitivity, specificity, kappa, ROC, area under the curve, concordant pairs, confusion matrices, lift charts, gains charts, Kolmogorov, Smirnov chart, and D statistics. We have covered an enormous amount of material in this class. And we did it all in R. So we have R and R Studio, and most of you, these are probably new tools. They're not the easiest tools in the world to learn, but you're able to pull off, I think, and in my opinion, a fantastic job of dealing with all kinds of crazy data throughout the various homework assignments and projects that you've worked on, and in applying a wide variety of methods to uh, all, the, all the different types of data that you've dealt with, and you did it all in a probably a brand new programming language for, for you. So congratulations on being able to pull that off. I'm hoping that you can now put this on your resumes in the future when you're looking for jobs or, or uh, you know, looking for promotions. You may or may not feel like you've mastered th this language, but this is a fantastic language to continue working on and using uh, both in your, in your career, academically, or professionally. The course goals, in a nutshell, are best expressed in the sentiment that I picked up from the Harvard Business Review. They were asking, what type of characteristics should you look for in a data scientist if you're wanting to, to hire somebody to come into your organization? And their, one of their answers was to make sure that a candidate can find a story in a data set and provide a coherent narrative about a key data insight. This, to me, is the intelligent part of intelligent data analytics. This is not just about using the tools, R or R Studio or MATLAB or SAS or whatever programming language that you uh, are most comfortable with. And it's not just about the techniques. You have a wide variety of techniques that you can apply to different types of problems. But it's going beyond that and saying, what is the true question? What is the business problem? What is the research question? And how can we address that? And then using the tools and methods to be able to draw out the important elements of the data, of the problem itself, and be able to have those insights that actually can make a difference. And then to be able to communicate those insights well. This ties back into one of our very first lectures, talking about the idea of what is the problem? What, what, is actually, what are we actually trying to accomplish in this project? And this also ties into the very last stage of the deployment stage. I don't have a series of lectures on the deployment stage, but it's all about taking these technical tools that you've have. Now you've applied that and you've developed some type of solution or answer or, or recommendations based upon answering that true underlying problem. And then how do you uh, deploy that and communicate that throughout your organization? And then you keep the models and the work that you have relevant to the problem. Because the, the problem as you go forward in time is not likely to be a static problem, but a dynamic problem. One that changes or the circumstances and, and the environment around you changes and you may have to update those models and update that uh, communication of what you can and can't do over time. In the deployment stage, and this is the last thing I'll say about that, it is usually a place where the data scientist will hand off the work uh, over to uh, the subject matter experts or the, or the technical experts that are you know, maybe, maybe in the IT department or, or wherever it happens to be. So you have to make sure that you clearly communicate uh, to the people that are going to be uh, using your models and your product so that they can understand uh, you know, the limitations and the potential within the work that you've already done.